Uh, so, um, yeah, let's see, like we sort of ended last time in the middle of, uh, of the climactic part of the other characteristic stuff. So let me just start by showing you a little bit of like the PDF notes from last time to just refresh your memory because if I write things again, it would just take forever. So let me go to our uh, Canvas site. Uh, let's see, so if you click on modules, I don't know if anyone has checked this, like, oh, did I upload, oh. Uh, oh, here it is, I mean, I, I did, uh, good, good. I did have like uploaded the PF, but I never added them to the to the modules part. So just in case, like let's do it right away. Here you go. So now you can find like the notes from last time. So if you like, let's just see what happened last time. Yeah. Can everyone see the PDF? Yeah, good, good. So, yeah. good, perfect. So again, like we had started with this like problem about the bridges. This was just sort of like a motivation. And we saw like more or less that Euler solved it and sh like showed that, um, that you could not cross like do a trip where you only cross each bridge once. <laughs> like the important part of like the, those videos were just to motivate the idea that you could create like a graph to understand this problem. So again, just remember that a graph is just like this collection of dots with edges. And we had said that a graph was cleaner if like whenever the two edge, like whenever two edges intersect, the intersection occurs only at these vertices, only at these dots, okay? And like you just do like this experiment like it may not have been obvious to you why look at this particular combination, but you can count the number of vertices, edges, and faces. Faces again, like being like sort of like the regions determined by uh, the edges, including like the outside of the graph. So like some like think of this as some sort of ocean. And like I mean, I suppose in everyone could think about making the list of these three numbers, right? Like that sort of seems like a, a little bit natural. What may be less clear is why you would look at this like particular fun combination of taking the number of vertices minus the number of edges and adding the number of faces, right? So we saw that like for this particular graph representing the Konigsberg problem, this combination happened to give you two, but then like the fun thing is like, okay, then you look at another combination, like a, a, a way more simple graph and you get two again when you do this combination like vertices minus edges plus faces. You look at a different graph, which seems quite different from the others. And you do the combination again and you get two, right? And like the point is that like Euler had shown uh, essentially that this combination for these planar graphs will always give you two. So like this combination again was called um, the Euler characteristic. And so what Euler showed was that for a planar graph, its Euler characteristic has to be two, okay? But then, uh, and, and again, that's still mysterious, like what's the, why it says that is true. What's if, and also uh, if it's always two, right? Uh, why is it useful? What would it be telling you, right? Like if you want to like, imagine that you wanted to give like a property to some object of study, Right. If every single object that you're studying like has the same value for that property, right? Uh, then it's not that useful if your purpose is to classify or like create like groups in which you can put the like the different objects together, right? Like so, if everyone just had like the uh, like the property of like if every single graph in the universe had the property of having all the characteristic two, it might be a curious fact, but it may not be so interesting as if we could find like graphs. We put Euler characteristic is not two, and that, like like that's where we were doing like at the end of the last time. So let me get back get to that point uh, very soon. So again, for planar graphs, the Euler characteristic is supposed to be two, but then like the cool thing is like you could take something like a cube. A cube already almost is given to you 
as a graph, if you think about it for a second, right? Like it already comes with vertices, edges, and you can think of the faces as the size of the cube. So it happened to be two. But again, like you could even like sort of draw more cool graphs on the cube, right? Like uh, this one was a little bit simple. Like I just added like uh, this for edges and the vertex, vertex, and I and still you still get two, right? And then like you could do something similar for the sphere, right? Which is what we did, like north and south southern hemispheres. Uh, you like then you think of the northern and southern hemispheres as the faces of the. Of of of, the, uh, of a graph, and then like uh, here you have two vertices, two edges, and you still get two. And again, um, there's nothing like specific, special about like just choosing these two vertices and two edges. Like you could still do things which are a little bit more fun uh, on the sphere, and you could get two. Right. So far, so good. Are there any questions about this? So we have said like uh, what I'm saying. So up to this point is planar graphs has all like have all their characteristic two. Cubes, apparently, if you think of trying to draw a graph on them, they also have other characteristic too. And spheres, if you try to draw like a graph on them, you also have like other characteristic too. Is that okay? So much good? Are there any questions up to this point? Good, good. Um, and, and I will tell you why all of these things uh, sort of fall into one category. Uh, that's where we're headed. But, uh, and so it seemed like we kept getting two and two and two and two and two. Uh, uh, oh, uh, well, the thing is like, uh, in the case of the sphere, right? The outside is sort of like three dimensional, correct? And the interior of the sphere is also like three dimensional. Right. So in a sense, like you have to sort of think of the sphere as being like, you don't want to think, I mean, it's sort of almost impossible because already when you think of the sphere, you already like see it like, oh, like inside this bigger space. Right. But you almost have to think about it as it being like the, like the entire universe itself. Right. So there's no outside of the sphere. There's no inside of the sphere. Uh, plus like, if you if still wanted to incorporate the outside, it's a different sort of outside to the ones that we looked at when we thought about the outside of a graph on the plane, because the outside of a graph of a plane, right? If you, right, like this outside, you know, like the one that I drew in blue, it's sort of like two dimensional, right? Uh, the outside of the sphere that you would be thinking about is sort of three, uh, three dimensional and that, uh, even if you wanted to include it, like you could not sort of count it as a face in the, I mean, you could like, you would need to treat it differently because it sort of has like a, a different dimension. Is that making sense? But the, still the philosophy here is like, um, this is difficult to like, it's a difficult uh, pill to swallow, right? Like, um, like the matrix, like you're being red peeled. Although now this has a lot of other connotations on YouTube, but like, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the the idea like in mathematics is like, if you think of like, if you wanted to think of the sphere as an actual universe, right? Uh, you would not like think necessarily that sort of like the sphere is floating in, in this bigger space, right? the sphere would be all that there is to the universe. So the question of what is outside the sphere like stops make, making sense because you sort of by fiat have de deleted the outside. There's no more outside. There would be no more inside. Is that making sense? So you could always like, that's like, um, I don't, I mean, if you want to try your, um, uh, did everyone watch this flatline fi film? Um, I don't know if anyone tried to. It's a fun film. If you haven't watched it, I still recommend it. Uh, let me just share that, like the screen again. Like, good, like I'll return to our notes, but like just to elaborate on this point.
right? Like for example, um, imagine that imagine that you had like a you had like a, a universe which is entirely two dimensional, right? Like a piece of paper, and you can think of a circle as a, a creature living on this universe, right? Uh, so if it's like a living creature, like it may have like organs in its interior, right? So I tried to draw a heart for the circle. <laughs> Although on the film, the circles are sort of psychopaths. They're trying to kill the other geometric figures. So maybe a heart is not the most appropriate, but uh, like imagine that you are like a doctor, right? Uh, living into this in this two dimensional universe and you wanted to do surgery, right? Like the card of the circle has a medical condition and you want to do some sur sort of surgery on the circle, right? Like, well, if you have like your scissors or whatever you're going to use to like cure the circle, like you have to sort of go, like, you know, go through the circumference, right? Like you, you have to like go through the skin of the circle. Is that making sense? But like, right, if you like were like a divine creature living in three dimensional space, I don't know, like, you know, like imagine like the circle is like here. If you had like, you just put like your hands on top of the heart and you do whatever you want and you never needed to go through the, like the skin of the circle, right? Like the circumference, is that making sense? Like you just put your hand on top of it. It is like one of these games, like board games, like a doctor. I don't know if you have seen it, but you do surgery. Yeah, you could reach out right, right, right. Like you just imagine coming like the hand from the Z axis, if you prefer. Is that, is that, is that clear? Now, here's something that maybe you haven't thought about, but if you had like, if there were like a fourth dimension in space, similar to this situation, like imagine someone wanted to do surgery on my heart or my brain, they could just throw in like a, heart, a hand literally coming from this extra dimension and doing like the surgery without ever having to go through my skin. Is that clear, the analogy? So, you know, like, uh, and in, in a way that like that would be like a cool thing, but like, uh, like but the, this two dimensional world is a two dimensional world in its own right. Correct, like um, you don't need to like think that it sort of lives inside this bigger space. Like that could become like an, it's actually like, that would be like an empirical question. Like that would be like, um, like you would need to see like manifestations of these extra dimensions on, on the space that you live in, right? Like for example, if like, if you were like a circle and you saw someone like somehow like their, your, like the surgery taking place miraculously without opening your circumference, then maybe you would be more inclined to conclude that there was this third dimension in space, right? But like there would be like some manifestation would be needed. So it's sort of similar in this like situation with the, With the uh, with the sphere, because the sphere is really like two dimensional universe in its own right, and you don't need to think about it as it's sitting inside a bigger space, despite the fact that it's sort of uh, it's like a very tempting idea. So that's why um, you still think that there are no outside faces in that sense for the sphere. Is that is that better now? But uh, now we come to the cool part. So, so far we are getting two, 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 a bunch of suits, right? When you were computing the Euler characteristic. Now I'm saying that uh, we can actually uh, look at the case of the torus, right? And I'll, I'll draw it in our notes, in the new notes again. So let me just give me a second to draw this picture one more time in the notes. Remember, like by torus, remember when I say torus, I just mean like this, like um, this donut, right? Uh, uh, 
Uh, sorry, I'll show you the other screen in a second. But here's a cool. Okay, so let me, I'll, I already drew it in the other in the other PDF. So let, let's go to that one. Oh, sorry, I shared incorrect, like the wrong thing. So here it's not correct. So, right, like, um, remember that like in the case of the donut, one way to think about the donut was that you could obtain it by just taking like a piece of paper, right? And then like putting some glue on these two opposite edges and just like gluing them together, right? Like literally just taking the paper and doing, uh, right? Like taking the piece of paper and doing like this. And then you got a cylinder, uh, but then like there were like these two remaining remaining edges that you could also glue together, which are like the orange, orange edges if you want here. And when you glue them together, like then you do get like the donut. So in this case, if you thought, if you think about it, like these two corn, four corners, which have, like in principle look like different corners. Like if you keep track of, like if you were to draw them on the piece of paper, like how they uh, start like, um, like for example, when you, uh, it's easier to see first like what's happening with the cylinder. You had like these four corners, but like, uh, when you do the first gluing, like they're sort of cut in half, like they just become two, these two dots because like once like they sort of sit one on top of the other and come in pairs. And then when you glue them again, like the, like the, these two dots, like just become one. And that's why I'm saying that you have one vertex here. And likewise, like uh, these two edges like look different, like, but they actually become the same once you glue them. And these two edges look different, but they become the same when you glue them. So this is why the here you have just one vertex, two edges, and uh, one face. And in this case, the only characteristic, if you do the same thing, uh, this gives you what? Like this gives you one minus two plus one, which is zero. Right. So what we had said was that the Euler characteristic. of the donut is zero, which for us, like the important thing is that it is not two. So uh, tears of joy. It, why is this nice that it's not two? because now this distinguishes it from every other case that we had seen before, right? So this is secretly telling us that there's something different between the torus, like between the donut and all the other uh, graphs that we had studied so far, uh, or, or all the other graphs that we did for the, the shapes that we had studied so far. Is, is this okay, so far so good? And I'm going to explain you right now what the difference is. Right? So first, like, is, is that okay? Would everyone make any questions up to this point? Yeah, good, good, good. So first, like, what, like, before telling you, like, um, so what do the, So what's the like, um, what's the relationship between the cube, the sphere, and the plane? 
why is it that like when you were drawing graphs in these three cases, like you were sort of uh, apparently getting the same answer. So anyone has heard of like the stereographic projection? Good, 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 excellent. Let's talk about this. Let me show you an animation for you. Right, right, right. Like that's what's going to be. Yes, that's basically what the relationship is. Like, good, good. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Let me show you the animation. Can everyone see the Wolfram demonstrations project um, thing of last year? Uh, Good, good. So like the idea of the stereographic projection, which is like um, occurred to Riemann, if I'm not mistaken, and Riemann will appear very soon in our story later, uh, maybe in a couple of lectures. Uh, if you have read the book, uh, maybe he was already mentioned there. But uh, what's like, what's the point of the stereographic projection? Like imagine that you look at the North Pole, imagine that you like draw the sphere, right? In such a way, which is not maybe the standard way that you would think about it, but like um, in such a way that the south pole of the sphere is like barely touching the xy plane, right? So like you just or just put like the sphere like on top of some of some material, right? Like some table. So you like the north, like the south south pole of the sphere is touching the 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 xy plane, and then like imagine that you had like a light pole or a laser from the North Pole, right? And so like the idea of the stereographic projection, uh, in, like, so like the, now think of the laser as draw, like, like from this like uh, North Pole, which is the source of the laser, like you just start throwing like around, or, or like around you can, you just start like shooting rays in every direction, right? And so here comes a ray, a ray, a ray, a ray, a ray, and it hits the sphere in this point, right? But then the rate continues and it hits the sphere at, and then it hits the plane at this other point. Is everyone seeing what's going on? So for example, like you have like another different rate which hits the sphere in this point and then it hits the plane on this point. So far so good? Is that, is that making sense what's going on? Cute. Now, like here is a, the cool thing. Right, like when the ray hits the sphere, like at, at some point, it will hit the the, the plane at, at, at another point, right? But it's not that it hits. I mean, it would not be the case that it will hit the sphere once and then the plane twice, or it would hit the sphere twice and then the plane once. Like for every point that it hits on the sphere, it will there will be a corresponding point that it hits on the plane. Is is that making sense? So it's what mathematicians call like one-to-one. -one. You did study functions, right? Like, you know, like these one-to-one -one functions or bijective functions, right? Uh, that terminology may uh, like sound familiar? Yeah. So like you, so you're you like sort of establishing like a corresponding saying to this point on the sphere corresponds to this point on the plane to this other point on the sphere corresponds to this other point of the plane. And as you move them around, right, like you, you, you get like, uh, you sort of start like sweeping out the, the entire, like all the points on the sphere, right? Uh, and here's the thing, like here's a cool fact, which uh, will be more clear to see if we could like sort of like zoom out in this example. 
but uh, I don't know. Ooh, can we do that? Yeah. Well, like sort of like what happens is that like as you move the points closer, like imagine that like if you hit like the if you hit the rays, if the rays are very close to the south pole, right, which is what's going on here, you see like um, like they sort of accumulate near the sphere, right? But as you move the rays, as the points, uh, if the points of, uh, of the sphere uh, start getting closer and closer to the North Pole, right? Do, do you see what's going on? Like, do you see the points on the plane getting away? And then we can assume more of this. But like the idea is that as you move like the points on the sphere, uh, towards the North Pole, like they sort of like will hit points on the plane that are farther and farther away from the from 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 the sphere, right? Is that okay? And so, um, like essentially, what actually ends up happening, and you can write this mathematically. It's like a very simple express formula to write. Like you can see, it like on Wikipedia, is that for any point on the plane, there will be a there will be like a corresponding point on the sphere, essentially. And the only point on the sphere that has nowhere to go is the North Pole, North Pole itself, right? Like, like, like the you cannot like right because that's where like the source of the laser is. But any other point on the sphere will go somewhere, and every point on the plane can be obtained uh, from like uh, from like uh, a corresponding point on the sphere. Okay, so this is why sometimes mathematicians like to say that the sphere is sort of like the x y plane, but you sort of like, like you know, like took the x y plane at infinity and collect like and glued like all the like imagine like somehow like the plane is infinite, but like you go sort of to infinity and you like at the at infinity you sort of like put come like make all all these points together come together into what would correspond to the north pole, so. Like what I'm trying to say is that like the distinction between the sphere and the XY plane, um, like they're almost the same uh, from this perspective because you can sort of put them in in a useful correspondence. Like it's only that you're missing the this North Pole when you're trying to create like this correspondence. And so like my point is that like if you had drawn like uh, imagine that you had drawn like a circle, right? You imagine you had drawn a, a, like a circle on the x y plane, then by you can keep by keeping track of like under this projection or under these lasers, you can draw a corresponding uh, sphere figure on the on the sphere, right? Uh, which in this case also gives you like uh, some sort of circle, and you could do the same for lines, right? Oh, and but now what do we have? Like this looks almost like a graph, right? <laughs> so like what I'm saying is that like in a sense you can draw like a, dra a graph that like uh like the point is that like those planar graphs that we talked about or in general like the like the graphs that you um were drawing on the on the xy plane you can sort of like translate them into graphs on the sphere is, is that clear is that making sense sort of like you can imagine like just drawing like a, a picture here on the xy plane and just be at this like laser stuff like just drawing what like that would come from on, on the surface of the sphere. Is that is that is that is that okay? And so like that's a like that that's a reason why, and that gives you like a better interpretation of why we were counting the outside of the graph, like the stuff outside the, of the graph, because from the perspective of the sphere, it's just like the rest of like the surface of the sphere that you're looking at. Right. Uh, so this is why you see, like in this, from this point of view, like the outside, like the outside of the graph is just like the rest of this uh, of the surface of the sphere, uh, and that's why it was counted, being counted as a face. And like it's actually like a cool question to see, like, oh, uh, if you draw something different, like. How does like a figure that you draw on the XY plane looks under like this stereographic projection? But so let me just like write like something on the PDF so that you you can keep this like on, as a note.
And so like, again, like, uh, like the point of the stereographic projection, again, cur courtesy of Riemann, uh, Oh my God, I may have forgotten if it, he has two M's or two, I mean, he has two N's in his name, but I don't remember if he has two M's. Well, hopefully he'll forgive me. So, uh, right, so I'm saying like, you just draw like from the laser, you draw uh, like you, with, you have a ray, the ray hits like a point here on the surface. Which then hits like this point on the plane. And so like the idea is like um, on the North Pole, uh, I mean, you can do uh, the projection point, like you, you mean like the, like the actual center? Like the thing is like, if you do the actual center, like for example, what would happen here? Like uh, if you, for example, draw a ray here, it causes a sphere in this way. But like when you continue the ray, then it won't cut the X axis, right? If you would need to extend it, this way so that it cuts the x, x sorry the x y plane here right but then now this ray cut cuts the sphere in two points while it cuts the plane into just one do you see what's going on here so by doing it from the center of the sphere you lose this pack that is like one-to-one. Uh, one. Well, right, like you could like, uh, good, good, good. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, like that I will get to in a minute. Yes, yes. But I'm just saying like, uh, at least if you're going to relate the, that like the thing of the center that you were saying works for more for the cube stuff, right? Cute observation, yeah, yeah. But not like, if you want to relate the plane with the, uh, if you want to relate the x y plane with the sphere, it's better to do the projection from this perspective. But if you want to relate the cube with the sphere, you can do what you're saying from the center. Like, and I'll I can get to that in a second if that's okay. Good, good. But yeah, good. I'm glad that like yes. I'm glad it's making sense. So I'm just saying that. So from the North Pole, uh, you can draw rays. Uh, with the property. That any other point on the sphere with the property that if they will um, they will connect any other point of the sphere on the sphere with some point on the XY plane. So if you draw a graph on the XY plane, you can sort of transport it back to the, so a graph
but like yeah for example like the uh, so like i would write it just once in fancy mathematical terminology Uh, what this is really saying is that there's a bijection. What that just means like one to one correspondence between the sphere without the minus the North Pole. And the XY plane. And again, for those who are reading the book, uh, this Bijection is actually a little bit more powerful. It's called uh, homeomorphism, but like you can ignore that name if you want for those reading the book. This is called uh, homeomorphism. This bijection is actually better. This has more properties. Making it a homeomorphism. Homeomorphism just means that, like, if you look at the function that define, like, you know, like, sorry, there's actually like a formula that you can write down saying, oh, which says like this point on the sphere to what particular point on the x y plane that's taken to. And homeomorphism just means that, like, that function will be continuous. And continuous just means that nearby points will be mapped to nearby points here, right? Like, that somehow if you had chosen, if you had moved this rate a tiny bit, then the point that it goes to moves by a tiny amount. You don't do anything weird where like uh, you move this a tiny amount and then like the point up re like appears like on the entire opposite side of the, of the sphere. Like tiny changes in the input somehow produce like tiny changes in the output more or less like that's the idea. It's a little bit more, it's a different bit more technical but that's the, the gist of it. And then like, uh, right, like to this question about what the cube and the sphere have in common, like you could imagine like putting like a sphere inside one of the Amazon boxes that you use for receiving products. So what's easier to draw? I think maybe it's easier to draw. Is it easier to drop the sphere first or, I mean, I don't know. But do you like, you see like what I'm trying to do like, and now you put like uh, uh, the sphere inside a box where like the North Pole perfectly, like, you know, the North Pole touches one, like this point, the South Pole touches this point, and like uh, there's one point that touches this other side. Like, you know, like it, it, it matches it perfectly. I suppose you don't have to do that, um, but it's more like exciting that way. And then like you, then you would put like the laser at the origin instead of like using the North Pole as a laser. And then here, like when you draw, like, again, like you start drawing rays. Uh, this is like an extreme case because here it hits the North Pole and already a point on the box. But like then like there are other rays that just hit like a point on the sphere and then like a point on the box and like, like right here. And like, then you can see, like, you will see that uh, if you do that, like every point on the cube. What this is saying, like, you know, it's like, if you were trying to trap the sun, like this is one way to think about it. If you thought about the sphere as the sun, what I'm saying is that every point on the cube, there will be like a light ray that passes through that point. Is that making sense? Through every point on the cube. So if you think of the sphere as the sun, then through every like uh, through every point of the cube there will be a light ray is, is that more or less clear and again, like what that means is like, if you had actually drawn like a graph from the sphere, you can do this light ray method to sort of try to draw like a graph from the cube and things like that. And so like, this is why uh, 
uh, you sort of don't think of the sphere as being essentially like for like uh, the things that we're studying, right? Like again, like you have to think about this like from a biology biological perspective where like you sort of ignore certain features when you're studying different species right otherwise you would not be able to classify them in a useful way so for the things that we're sort of like for the kinds of questions that we're asking the fact that um we are like uh, being able to create this correspondence or this bijection between the cube and, and the sphere tell us that for our practical purposes like we won't bother too much in distinguishing between distinguish distinguishing them like they sort of belong to the same genus or family or uh, kingdom or whatever in biology so but like the idea is like if you were to try to do that uh between the the torus and the sphere you could not do this but then no matter how hard you try You will never be able to find like a bijection. I mean, like a homeomorphism, like this, like. Such a correspondence. So there's no way to do like a laser method that will allow you to create this correspondence between the torus and the donut. It doesn't like those are the same. The the donut and the sphere. It doesn't matter how creative you want to get, you will never be able to do such a correspondence. Uh, for uh, I mean, there I suppose there could be many ways to see this, but for us, like the way in which we think one would think that one could see this is is actually because these correspondences need to these correspondence correspondences can only be established between spaces with the same Euler characteristic. So the idea is like the Euler characteristic that you compute has to be preserved, like for at the very least for two spaces to for you to be able to establish such a correspondence, you at the very least need that the order characteristics start to be the same. And so this cannot work. Because at a minimum, the order their order the order characteristics would need to be the same. So that's like uh, one of the ways in which the Euler characteristic comes in handy because like you were trying, like, you know, like uh, there was, like, I don't remember like a couple of lectures ago, someone had asked me, well, oh, but then how you distinguish the spaces, right? Like you, maybe you, someone was thinking about it from like the, like the perspective of the equations and things like that, like defining uh, the sphere or like maybe you tried to find like an equation defining the donut. But like the idea is like you start trying to distinguish it, distinguishing them by like attaching like numbers or other things to these spaces, which you know have to be preserved whenever you try to find correspondences between them. So if you know that you at, like gave a different number to the sphere and you know you gave a different number to the donut, that means that no matter how you creative you get, you can never like um, I like the, like create a correspondence in the same way in which you were able to create like a correspondence between the sphere and and the cube. Is, is that making sense? So um, that's like what mathematicians call invariance. So, uh, so like the other characteristic is called like an invariant of your space. Uh, 
and what we will see like and this is really the cool thing like eventually like we'll get to it like in maybe one or two more meetings we will see that the other characteristic is actually related also to the curvature of the space uh we'll see this only characteristic number this number will also tell you something about how the space your space is curved but we have to talk about curvature first so i, I won't do this right now So far so good. Uh, and in fact, like, I think I, I may have said this uh, at the end last time, but like, again, like the meaning of the older characteristic, if you have a, like, there's a, a thing called the genus of a surface. Uh, which just means like pictorially, like the number of holes. Uh, So like here, like you would say the genus is zero, the genus is one, the genus is two, here like for the pretzel, the genus is three, okay? Then there will be one like with genus four. Everyone sees where, where we're going with this? Genus five. Yeah. So for every number of holes, like for every number, for every positive integer or zero, you can sort of find like, you can sort of just draw like a surface with that number of holes, right? And like, first of all, like the key property of the Euler characteristic is that it ends up giving you two minus two G. So the Euler characteristic is actually two minus two G. So it's two minus two times the number of holes. Uh, so meaning like, for example, for the case of, uh, of the sphere, right? Like the ones that we had done was it for the sphere, like the genus is zero. So the Euler characteristic should be two minus two times zero, which is two, right? Which is what we had found before. And then for the case of the donut, right? The genus is one, it has one hole. And so the other characteristic is like two minus two times one, uh, which is zero. Is that making sense? Like, so we had found already these two numbers from before. So like the point is that the other, like in a sense, uh if you know the other characteristic right like uh that means that uh oh uh like at the very least, you only need one point on the surface, like where you can um, do the projection from, right? Uh, it, is, it is not required that for every point on the surface, you need that like, you could find like somehow like a smart projection. It, 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 is that making sense? So it would suffice to know that there's one point on the surface, but that here's even better. Like here's a, like the cool thing. Like even when I was doing the projection, you know, I drew like, for example, the, the sphere and I drew like uh, the X, Y plane. And I sort of saw both of, both of them again, like sitting in this higher space, right? In this 3D space where I was drawing the lasers, right? But mathematically, when you say that there is no projection, right? Like when I'm saying that there's no projection from the sphere, 
to the donut. I'm saying that it doesn't matter if, if you had chosen like to use a method that's not like the laser method, right? Like you, it's not that you have to draw the sphere next to the donut and try to see if like, is there like a way to put like one relative to the other to do the projection, right? It's like an abstract statement. Like you sort of imagine like as the sphere in its own like void because like it's its own universe and you imagine the donut in as its own universe, right? Like they don't sort of need to be sitting in this higher dimensional 3D space. And what I'm saying is like, no matter like how what try, try like type of uh correspondence you were trying to do between the two like could be lasers could be other like physical mechanisms like because the point is like you don't even require like a physical mechanism for this you would never find one that's like the, the, the idea so uh, i'm just trying to illustrate things concretely right so that it makes more visual sense but uh, like like the point is that again like you can almost think of them as like universes that don't do not even interact with one another. They don't like you know in all these pictures like they were sort of like the the sphere was touching the plane and the sphere was also touching the cube. This is not necessary for the argument. Like the 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 the, the things can sort of sit uh, apart from one another. They don't even need to be sort of drawn in the same uh, higher dimensional space together. If that makes sense. So it's like a way more powerful statement like that what I'm painting it to be. It's like, you can, like this is like, uh, like this impossibility things in mathematics, like it's just like, um, no matter like what sort of representation you try to do of the problem, you will never succeed at, at, at finding a solution. And so like one way to think of the of this equation is that like, this is saying that the two times the number of holes equals um, the Euler characteristic minus two. And so if you wanted, like you could also think, if, if you thought like, oh, maybe it's easier to find the Euler characteristic, you could also uh, use this formula to, to, like the, to find the uh, number of holes. Uh, in fact, what happens like, in this particular case, it's even more interesting, which, and that is that uh, there's like a thing called the classification of surfaces. Uh, I suppose that was proven sometime in the 19th century. Uh, although like the proof itself, like is full details for a mathematician took more time, but like there's like a, a thing called the classification of surfaces. Uh, which says that um, essentially every surface can be, uh, you know, for any surface in the universe that you could imagine, like um, you could always like sort of put it in a one, um, in correspondence to one of the surfaces that I was drawing in the before. So for any surface, well, strictly speaking, um, I don't know if you remember, like I mentioned the movie strip, uh, like there's like spaces where like, um, you know, you cannot define like what it means to be right-handed properly. And so I'm ignoring those. I'm just saying like those were like, um, uh, there's like some sort of notion of right and left-handed for people. So, um, again, like the full details, uh, The, the, like the precise statement would uh, take more time than that, that is worth to state. But I'm just saying like, if you uh, if you live in a universe where you can talk about being right-handed or left-handed, then uh, your universe can be drawn. Like, you know, there will be like a laser type thing that you could do to put that shape of your universe in correspondence to the one of these like pictures I was drawing before. Is that making sense? So like what I'm saying is that essentially uh, there's like a complete list, like another way to say this more verbal in a more verbal way is that there's like a complete list 
like there's a complete table of all the two dimensional universes basically so and any universe that you would hand to me which is two dimensional i can i can sort of just go down the list and find where it should be placed like there's like a complete understanding of of, of this case Is that making sense so far, sir? Uh, good, good. Uh, okay, so we have 20 minutes. I think I'll mention a little bit more about the like the 3D case, like which will be put on hold for a while because like next time, like next time we'll do, is that I don't want to start this discussion right away because like I would need to repeat it to lar a large extent. So next time what I will do is just tell you how this Euler characteristic can also be related to the notion of curvature and what is a geodesic. I'll tell you about that next time. Uh, but uh, let me at least just mention quickly what happens in the three-dimensional case, which is again, like sort of like the type of universe that we're, we're interesting, interested in. So again, remember like the formula of the Euler characteristic. For like uh, a, a surface. By this, I just mean like a, a, a graph on the on, on the x y plane. Or this donut. Oh, by the way, I, before I keep going, sorry, I, maybe I should show you this cute animation. And let's see if I can find it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let me show you this for a second and then I'll return to this thing. Can everyone see the new Wolfram's Wolfram demonstrations project thing? Good. And this is cool. Uh, this is like showing you how to like draw other graphs on the donut. Like again, um, if you think about the, this is like the, the, like the paper version, the pa paper representation of the donut, right? Where like, for example, this edge was supposed to continue to this edge, right? And this edge re continues here, right? I don't know if you remember like the game with the rat and the cheese that we played uh, in one of the animations. So if, we're, if you were like the rat at this uh, purple dot and you keep moving on, on this edge, on this edge, on this edge, you sort of reappear here, right? Is that, everyone remembers this? Yeah, I remember. Good, good, good. And then like, uh, ooh, now it looks better. And so again, like it's sort of cool to see how that would actually look up, like on the donut. And so, uh, so for example, like you see, like there's like, a, here's the purple dot. And if you went through the edge, it's sort of connected to the pink dot. And so you see sort of like the connection here. And so like there are graphs that again, like can sort of be, be drawn on the, on the, on the surface of the uh, of the donut, and you can like uh, and this looks a little bit nicer. And then you and again like if you were to count the Euler characteristic of this, like it, it would give you like one. But those are harder to do like than the ones that the examples that I showed you before. Oh, and here like ooh, there here are different models. Oh my god, it is so fun. So this is cute, right? Uh,
is this okay? Um, so now, but again, all the characteristic was like vertices minus edges plus faces, right? Uh, the vertices were like dots, which are zero dimensional, right? The edges are like, at, like one dimensional because they're just like line segments, right? And the faces are like two dimensional, right? So the only characteristic is like uh, as as a sum with signs between something zero dimensional, the count of something zero dimensional minus the count of something one dimensional plus the count of something two dimensional. Is that making sense? So like in the three dimensional case, like there's like a story that goes. So this is like for two D. For 3D, like there's something similar you can do, like you can do like vertices minus edges plus faces minus D, and I'll use that for boxes. I mean, this is no, this is no longer standard terminology. And so again, like the idea here is like this is like sort of zero dimensional. Uh, this one was one dimensional. This one was like two dimensional, and like by boxes, I just mean like the interior of the box, like that, some like the interior of the Amazon box or whatever. So this would be like three dimensional. And so this would be like the formula for the Euler char characteristic of a three dimensional universe. So this is like the three D version of the Euler characteristic. So for example, like at least we can actually use like not many people could do this like without taking like a higher math class but we can actually now find the only characteristic of at least um, one 3d universe which i don't do you remember after i showed you the game of the rat i then show you like this game with the pipes where like the pipe connected to the roof and then you got down from the seat like you know the one that was like the 3D tours where like if you appear from one wall, you came from the other one. Um, where like, uh, like you had the cube where like the sides were being identified in pairs, right? So what would happen here? Like again, like this one is a little bit harder to visualize. So this is what like the one that's called the 3D torus. And like, like the idea here is like, this is similar, like the idea is like, is this similar to the logic behind the, 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 the donor, right? So it, like, again, like the difficult thing is that now we cannot do the gluing visually, but like there's some gluing ha happening. So for example, for the case of the, of the, of the donut, like the, all the vertices became one after you glued the opposite edges, right? So here, remember that like we're gluing, like, like the idea is that you're gluing opposite faces, opposite sides of the cube with one another. So if you could keep track of the gluing, which is again, not easy to visualize, you would say that there's like all these, a priori you had like what, eight vertices, they will sort of collapse into one. So you get one vertex, this is similar to what's happening on the cube. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, then how many edges do you have? Well, the thing is like sort of, again, like the edges that are sort of parallel to one another, they all become one after you do all the glue. I mean, you don't, it's okay. Not all of this makes sense, but like the idea is like, this, like the edges that are parallel to one another, 
become the same after you glue all the sides together. So that's why I'm drawing them with different colors. You have um, blue, purple, and red. So they're really just three edges, like, so E is three. And then you have uh, how many sides of the cube, how many faces? Well, a priori, a, a cube has six faces, but they're being glued in pairs. So you only get three at the end. And then how many boxes are there? There's just one, like the one you see here, like the interior of, of the cube. And so you get one box. And so the other characteristic for this one is like one minus three plus three minus one, which is zero. Did that sort of make some sense? I, again, it's, it's okay, not all of it is clear, but. It, 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 I'm just saying like, it, it happens similar to what happened for the donut. Uh, it's just that you have like, it's a little bit trickier, but you can compute other characteristics for other 3D universes. Uh, the other characteristic for other 3D universe, like uh, in 3D, the other characteristic is not as useful because it always actually gives you zero. Uh, And so that just means that you need more information to distinguish the universes. It's not enough to, like if you just look at the other characteristic, everything sort of would seem to be the same, but uh, there's more information that the other characteristic in this case is not detecting that would tell you other ways to distinguish in them. But like maybe that could be mentioned later, but the, that just means that other methods are needed. Is that making sense? So I'm just saying like Euler characteristic can be actually can be defined in any number of dimensions. I'm just saying it, it's, it can, in some dimensions, it can be more useful than others as a number. In dimension three, it's not that useful just because everything ends up having Euler characteristic zero. One of the reasons for why that's the case that are, that's actually interesting to know, but like that would take us a little bit too far from what we're doing. I'm just saying that just because two spaces have the same one characteristic in this particular case that does not mean that they have to sort of you need to be able to put them in like this sort of one to one correspondence. Uh, it's just that you need more information to to be able to like find that out. Is, is that okay? So I actually think, I mean, this is a perfect way to end things, even if it's a little bit earlier, because the next topic would be like a little bit perpendicular to what we have been saying. So I don't know if there's anyone who wants to ask me something different, like a question or whatever. If not, like feel free to, to go and uh, we can keep talking next week then. Are there any questions? Anyone wants to chat? Uh, well, uh, there are many nuts are very popular these days. There are many, uh, like there, there, there are things called like nut projections. Like, have you read any book on nut theory? There are actually some books on nut theory, which are very like, uh, elementary in the sense that like there, you don't need a lot of math to read about them. Uh, but like you can like sometimes you can sort of take a nod and you can project it on the xy plane and from the projection you can sort of try to cook up some invariance but yeah like um knots are very like like they're like ways in which they are analyzed which are similar to what we have been discussing like uh, like looking at this thing of the projections is so somewhat similar to like working with the uh, graph so uh but yeah it's uh, I could not give you like a good answer. Like if you email me, I can, 
yeah. there's like a uh, well yes and no it's a little bit more complicated because on um, for the notch you want to sort of keep track of which edge is on top of the other uh, uh, but like it, it, there's a similar like analysis that you can it's like a very like there's there are some parts that are very similar to analyze but like if you send me an email i can give you at least some reference to tell you a little bit more depending on what you want but yeah like uh that like they ha like there's like a part of that theory that's very la related to graphs yeah is that okay Anyone else? Okay, well, if something comes up, just always feel free to email me. Uh, I'm happy to give you more recommendations. So otherwise, uh, I'll see you next week. As I mentioned, I will create like some sort of poll just to assess like how you're feeling about the course, like what you what your thoughts have been, like what did you have found easy, difficult. It's more like just like some sort of just tell me how you're like digesting the material. Like there's no right or good, like wrong answer. So that like I just I'm just curious like how much sense everything is making. So uh, because this is like a, a, compli a complicated topic. So yeah, yeah. I I'll see you uh, next week then. You too, you too, bye.